checking procedures have been properly followed. That is, he determines for himself that the equipment he'll be working on has been properly isolated and tagged out for his safety while doing the maintenance operations. Next, he checks the manufacturer's instruction book, which was provided with this pump. What he looks for here is any construction details that he should be aware of for the bearing he'll be taking apart. He also looks for any hints, guidance, or procedures that the manufacturer provides for bearing disassembly and inspection. Now, the first step required before disassembling the bearing is a thorough cleaning of the bearing housing. And to prevent any foreign material which results from that cleaning from getting into the coupling or into the seal on the pump, he covers these two components with rags. After doing this, he takes a wire brush and brushes the outside of the bearing housing to break loose any foreign material which may be on it. He pays particular attention to the areas around the bolts which hold the two halves of the housing together and also along the mating surfaces between the two housing halves. Now I can't overemphasize the importance of this. Clearances within bearings are extremely small and even a minor amount of contamination, grit, dirt, or anything like that, which gets into the bearing during maintenance operations can result in bearing damage. After wire brushing the surfaces, he uses a clean rag to brush off any foreign material which was dislodged by the brushing. After this cleaning has been completed, he can then, of course, remove the rags that he placed over the coupling and the seal, because there's no further hazard of contamination of these components. And then he's ready to begin disassembly of the bearing. Now, in this case, the first step he performs is a very important one. That's to match mark the two halves of the bearing housing. Now, you may not see the reason for this when you first look at things, because the lower half obviously isn't going to be removed. So why is it necessary to match mark the two parts? Well, it's possible to put the top half on backwards if care isn't exercised. So he match marks the two mating surfaces to keep this from happening. Next, he's ready to drain the oil from the reservoir on the bearing. This is accomplished by removing a drain plug from the bottom of the bearing housing. So he loosens the plug with a wrench. And then, following our facility procedures, he gets a small glass jar and drains a portion of the oil into the jar. The reason for this is to provide a sample that we can use to check for sediment and moisture. If necessary, it can be sent to an outside lab for chemical analysis. Now there's another important thing to do when draining oil from a bearing. And you'll notice he's going to do it right now. That's to feel the oil for any grit, dirt, or metal particles. With the oil draining from the bearing and the sample set aside, he places the drain plug and filler cap in a plastic bag to protect them during the maintenance work. Next, he's ready to begin the actual disassembly of the bearing. In the case of this bearing, the first step is to withdraw two dowel pins, which are used to keep the two halves of the bearing housing aligned. These dowel pins are simply threaded pins with a nut on one end and a smooth surface on the other. They're inserted in the two bearing housings for alignment purposes before the studs are tightened. To withdraw the dowel pins is simply a matter of holding the pin steady with one wrench while the nut is threaded down with another. By doing this, the pin is pulled out of the bearing housing. These steps, of course, are repeated for the second dowel pin. With both dowel pins removed, they are put in a protective container, in this case, a plastic bag. This prevents damage occurring to them during the maintenance work. With both dowel pins removed and safely stored, the workman then loosens the nuts on the studs which attach the two halves of the bearing housing together. He follows good practice and loosens the nuts in a crisscross pattern. In this way, the stresses on the housings are relieved evenly and the possibility of warping of either half of the housing is minimized. After loosening all four nuts in a crisscross pattern, they can then be removed by hand. So he unthreads each of the four nuts and, as with the other parts, places them in a plastic bag to protect them during the maintenance operations. With the four nuts removed, the top half of the bearing housing can be lifted off. This half, of course, contains the top half of the bearing shell as well. With the parts removed, he then wipes them off using a clean, lint-free rag 
to allow a visual inspection. We're going to discuss some more detailed inspection methods as we go along, but an early visual inspection can detect major wear or damage. After looking at it and finding none, he places the top half down on a clean surface. You'll notice he places it in such a way that contamination is minimized. He then wipes off the exposed parts, including the mating surfaces of the two bearing housing halves. And again, the cleaning is done with a clean, lint-free rag to minimize the possibility of contaminating any of the bearing parts. The idea here is to wipe away excess oil so that a visual examination can be conducted. He also wants to clean off any grit or loose material which may exist in order to prevent it getting into the bearing and causing further damage. In the course of this, he performs a limited examination of the parts, specifically the two bearing oil seal collars and also the oil slinger ring to see if they're in a good state of repair and okay for reuse. If they're not, further disassembly would be required in order to replace either of these components. In this case, he finds no problems. Before removing the lower half of the bearing shells, the shaft must be lifted slightly to take the load of the journal off the lower half of the shell. In this case, he uses a pre-cut wooden block and two hardwood wedges. He places the block under the coupling. Then he inserts the wedges and taps them lightly with a hammer. Now all that's required here is to lift the shaft a few thousandths of an inch to be able to remove the lower bearing shell. With the shaft lifted, he then cleans off his hands because he's again going to be handling a bearing part and he doesn't want to contaminate bearing parts. He then takes a hardwood dowel and a hammer to start rolling out the lower half of the bearing shell. He taps the dowel lightly to begin movement of the shell. Once they've been broken loose, in most cases, these shells can be turned by hand, as this one can. So after setting his tools aside, he then manually turns the shell. He takes a metal pin and places it in one of the oil drain holes to fully turn the shell around. After doing this, he then carefully lifts the shell away from the journal to minimize the possibility of damage to the journal or to the slinger ring when the shell is removed. Now this shell also gets a thorough visual examination as soon as it's removed. He uses a clean, lint-free cloth to wipe off any excess oil that remains on the shell before visually examining it. Again, his visual examination in this case shows no obvious signs of damage so further investigation will be required to determine why the bearing was running hot. 